Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1093 of the Juice Box Podcast. Heather had been a nurse for 15 years when her seven year old daughter, Liza, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. This episode has a lot. Again, I, it's hard for me to like encapsulate it all here for you, but there's a crazy diagnosis story that includes DKA and so much more. Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan. Don't forget to save 40% off of your entire order at CozyEarth.com. All you have to do is use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. That's JUICEBOX at checkout to save 40% at CozyEarth.com. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year's supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash JUICEBOX. If you're not already subscribed or following in your favorite audio app, please take the time now to do that. It really helps the show. And get those automatic downloads set up so you never miss an episode. Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G7 and G6 continuous glucose monitoring systems. Dexcom.com slash juicebox. This episode of the Juicebox podcast is sponsored by the insulin pump that my daughter wears, Omnipod. Learn more and get started today with the Omnipod Dash or the Omnipod 5 at my link, omnipod.com slash juicebox. Okay, uh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, I was making a post for the for the Facebook page while you were talking. So hold on, I'm not quite oh. done. <laughs> Let me okay. finish. Let me just finish. <laughs> no worries. People are like, how do you do all this? And the answer is I have two computers and I'm constantly doing two things at the same time. So are you headed to Savannah? Is that why you're going to Atlanta? Yes, we're taking, we're picking Arden up. I think I'm supposed to say Arden goes to school in, where am I supposed to say? Chicago. Yeah. Uh, but oh, yeah, gotcha. but, but we're, but we're going <laughs> She was on one time and she's like, tell people I'm going to Chicago. And I'm like, okay. I did thoroughly enjoy her episode. Oh, thank you. She'll be back at some point. Um, she'll be home soon. So yeah, we're going to, so it, it, this started out as, this started out as we're going to just record Heather. Okay. Is that fine? We can just keep talking. Perfectly yeah, fine. Okay. okay. So we'll introduce you in a minute. It started okay. out as Arden has a car at school and she's coming home. And that went to my wife going, I don't like her driving all that way by herself for the first time. And I said, okay. I was like, well, what, what's your plan? And she said, I'm going to drive down and drive back with her. And I said, wait, you're going to drive down and then just tandem drive back with her? And she's <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm like, I, I mean, that's still driving alone. Now you're driving it too. And we had it all set up. She was going to drive like halfway. And then we were going to put her in a hotel, like not like a seedy, like people get murdered hotel, like a decent place where she could sleep the night and then, you know, finish up. And Kelly's like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want her to do that alone. I was like, well, why don't you fly down and drive back with her? So we told Arden that Arden goes, I need all the space in my car. I can't bring a person. And she's <laughs> like, I have a lot of clothes to transport home. And I'm like, okay. So I said to my wife, well, I'm not letting you do that. So I'll drive you down there and then you can well, I don't know what the hell, like, but I'm not, you know, I'll go with you. So that's and, funny. Yeah, so anyway, we're telling my son and my son's like, oh, you know, the Phillies are in town that week. So if you guys just left two days earlier, you could go to a Phillies game with me, hang out. I have a day off, etc. cetera. So I'm, that's nice. So we're going to, so now we're driving to Atlanta tomorrow and then spending the evening, getting up the next day, hanging out, going to the ball game. Then we wake up on Friday morning. He's got to go back to work right away. So we're going from Atlanta to Savannah. Then that's like a four hour drive still. And mm -hmm. then we're going to spend a couple of days in Savannah while Arden finishes up. Like we're just going to relax a little bit there and then uh, help her pack up and put her stuff in storage. And she's actually storing stuff and bringing stuff home. And, so uh, basically, you're you're you are taking this trip so you can say you were a good husband. That's pretty much why. Well, Heather, 
I like the way you say that because I'm not going to get that credit here. But it's exactly what my husband did when I went skydiving. That is exactly. Oh, he went. Um, he went with you. Well, he went, and the whole time we were driving there, he said, "I can't believe you're going to jump out of a plane." We have two kids at home, and all of this, and I was. Um, putting my suit on and getting everything ready. And I look over there and he's taking everything out of his pockets and he's stepping on the scale because you have to mm -hmm. weigh before. And I said, babe, what are you doing? And he said, what kind of husband would I be to let my wife jump out of a plane and me not do it with her? <laughs> <laughs> he realized you didn't have any life insurance. He's like, I might as well jump out of the plane too. <laughs> jump out of the plane with her. <laughs> so yeah. If I got to take care of the kids by myself, I'm going to wish I was dead. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> No, um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, like, I don't think of it that way, but it would be nice if someone else did once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Just sort of like, hey, I, you're doing a nice thing here. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think yeah. my wife has high expectations. I think I'm just doing what she expects of me. I don't know what this I'd have true. to do to, to like, to get like a yippee from her. I'm not sure. So that's got to be what, at least a 12 hour drive? Oh, it's four. For it's four. It ends up being 14. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Mm. Um, and yeah. nonstop. And in South Carolina, people can't drive. And it slows everything down that way. And by the way, what I mean by that is it's like they won't speed up or change lanes. Mm -hmm. It's very methodical. Like, here's where Atlanta my... is the same way. Well, Atlanta is like, well, actually, Atlanta is like that video game where you like beat people up NASCAR. in the street. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's insane. I've, uh, the last time I was in Atlanta, I saw, this is not a lie, I was in Atlanta for, I want to say, four days. We went down, it was Arden's spring break, Arden went over to Atlanta, Arden, Kelly and I stayed in a hotel, and we hung out with Cole for four days, then we went back to Savannah, set Arden up for school and came home. Mm -hmm. um, I saw two, I am not over-exaggerating, hit-and-run accidents in Atlanta <laughs> in four days, and one of them one of them was an SUV. So we were stuck in traffic. There was a car and an SUV behind it. And I was behind the SUV to the right. So I had like a full view of what was happening with them. The SUV got, I, I don't know what, like none of us were going very far. Um, but they saw a gap in the left lane and they tried to shoot the gap. So they cut the wheel hard and drove over the back left corner of the car in front of them. Like hit it went up and over it and then continued driving. Wow. And I, about a half a mile later, saw a police officer on the side of the road who was there for the construction. And I pulled over and I like said, hello. And he's looked at me and like, I, you know, I kept my hands up. I was like, hi. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and I was like, uh, there's a black SUV. It's this kind of car. It's only right there. I pointed. I'm like, it's right there. It just was involved in a hit and run. They were the hit. The car's behind us about a half a mile. It's It can't move. And I'm telling you that car was just involved in a hit and run. If you stop it, you will see a ton of damage on the front of the car. And he goes, that's not what I'm here for. Oh, wow. And I was like, wait, what? And, and I said, I don't understand. I said, like, I, I think I have the plate. And he goes, yeah, I'm just here for the construction. Nice. And I was like, well, what about the car that's disabled behind us? And he goes, they'll call 911. And, like, <gasps> and I was like, and I, all I could think was, but you're here. And, and he, yeah. he did not care. I was like, okay. He, wow. I think he was like, buddy, this is Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Keep moving or I'll hit you with my car. <laughs> so wow. anyway, my son tells me constantly about how terrible the driving is there. I, I do hate to drive through Atlanta. We go frequently. Mm -hmm. um, we're bad to go just for the weekend to Atlanta because it's about three hours from here. Mm -hmm. um, but I do hate the traffic yeah. driving through there. Great city. Really nice. Time. My son seems like he enjoys it enough and all that stuff. But um yeah anyway i mean he literally drove, all... drove up over the car and the other one was just um two people in the middle of the road screaming at each other and they just run into each other and then while they were yelling one of them just got in the car and drove away and i was like oh okay okay <laughs> <laughs> that's how yeah. we're doing I guess that's how we're doing it now anyway uh wow. 
Heather, why are you on the show? Do you have diabetes? Does your kid have diabetes? What's the situation? I do not. Um, my daughter has diabetes. And back in, I think it was August. I mean, I may, I've been on your books for quite a while. Mm-hmm. I cannot remember if it was you or maybe someone in the group have posted a question about were there any nurses or doctors who missed their child's diagnosis. Okay. And I commented on there that when Liza, her name is Liza, and when Liza was diagnosed, I had been a nurse for 15 years. Wow. And I missed it, but so did, uh, it took three trips and three different MDs before it was caught. Um, so not only did I miss it, but two other doctors missed it before she was in, I mean, she, which I know we'll get to that, but when Liza was finally diagnosed, I had multiple doctors tell me that she would not walk out of the hospital. So she was very sick by the time you it was actually found. Figured it out. So when is, when's the first time on a timeline that you realize something's wrong, but you don't know what it is? Today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Omnipod. And before I tell you about Omnipod, the device, I'd like to tell you about Omnipod, the company. I approached Omnipod in 2015 and asked them to buy an ad on a podcast that I hadn't even begun to make yet. Because the podcast didn't have any listeners, all I could promise them was that I was going to try to help people living with type 1 diabetes. And that was enough for Omnipod. They bought their first ad. And I used that money to support myself while I was growing the Juice Box podcast. You might even say that Omnipod is the firm foundation of the Juice Box podcast. And it's actually the firm foundation of how my daughter manages her type 1 diabetes every day. Omnipod.com slash Juice Box. Whether you want the Omnipod 5 or the Omnipod Dash, using my link lets Omnipod know what a good decision they made in 2015 and continue to make to this day. Omnipod is easy to use, easy to fill, easy to wear. And I know that because my daughter has been wearing one every day since she was four years old, and she will be 20 this year. There is not enough time in an ad for me to tell you everything that I know about Omnipod, but please, take a look. Omnipod.com slash juicebox. I think Omnipod could be a good friend to you, just like it has been to my daughter and my family. We were actually, it's funny, we were actually on vacation in Florida in August of 2020. And Liza started just saying she didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, we're at the beach. We're at the beach all day long. And um, and yes, she was thirsty, but hindsight, I don't think it was enough for us to, for it to really be more than it being Florida heat in August and we're outside all day long, that kind of thing. And she complained of her, her belly hurting. And Liza has, has always had some reflux issues. So we just attributed it to, oh, she's got some reflux going on. And then her throat started hurting, which is not abnormal for her. Usually her stomach would hurt and then she would sometimes throw up and then she would have strep throat. That has been Liza for years. Hmm. So that went on for maybe a day and a half, two days. And so the next day I got up and I said, I told my husband, I said, I'm going to run her to urgent care. Um, Cause if it is strep throat, we need to get some antibiotics. And it was right in the middle of COVID. Nobody was seeing anybody. Yeah. Um, so we were in a, a town. We did not know what, and um, we go to urgent care. And of course they just immediately are like, this sounds like COVID. And I'm like, she doesn't even, Okay, if that's what you guys think. So they um, didn't even do a a strep test or a blood test or anything. They told me that it was viral, most likely, mm-hmm. and possibly COVID to watch her. And so I was like, okay. So we went back to our condo, and she progressively, that was on a Wednesday. Friday, I when I got up that morning, I told my husband, I said, we're going home. Something's not right. She's sick. This is miserable. We're going to, we're going to pack our things up and we're going home. So we did. And on the way home, 
she was just ex- just sleepy. But she just kept saying, my throat hurts, mama, my throat hurts. And so we stopped at a, a different urgent care, half almost halfway home. Because at this point, I w- really was concerned that this might be COVID because she was starting to have some of the COVID symptoms. She was tired. Her her nose was running. She It was just not your typical strep throat sickness for her. Yeah. And so we got to that urgent care and he's like, oh, yeah, I think this definitely is COVID. So he swabbed her for COVID. And it was, of course, at that point in time, they there they did not have rapid tests in the building. Everything had to be sent off. Yeah. So he also swabbed her for strep, and the strep was negative. And he did blood work. Hindsight again is twenty twenty. He but they only did a CBC. If only they would have done a CMP right then, they would have seen a glucose. Mm-hmm. But they didn't. They just done the CBC. And of course, her white count was elevated. At that point in time, the COVID treatment was a uh, zithromycin and prednisone. So here we go. We, we leave there and we go to the, a local pharmacy there and get her antibiotics and her steroids. And she gets one dose of steroids and her antibiotic and we make it home. And we spend the night at home. We get everything. And she's still just so tired so tired yeah the and sat- the steroid didn't kick her up at all huh i'd like to thank dexcom for sponsoring this episode of the juice box podcast and at the same time i want to remind you that seeing your blood glucose levels in real time not only the number but the speed and the direction is going to help you in ways that you maybe can't imagine right now you should definitely check it out at dexcom.com slash juice box oh no mm. and then saturday she gets her second dose of steroids and her antibiotic and she she's more thirsty i guess but she's like i'm not really hungry mama i, I just want something to drink and of course she, she's drinking Kool-Aid because i mean you know it's summer and that's what we had in the fridge and all this stuff and fast forward to sunday morning around 3 and she wakes me up and she's standing by my bed She says, Mama, I can't breathe. And when I look at her, I immediately know something's wrong. And of course, now she was actually doing like the 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 classic DKA respirations. Yeah, those Um, those Kusmal respirations. But you thought she was, you thought COVID was killing her, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did 100%. Because at this point in time, and again, I'll pause there for a second. Liza did not really, she was not wetting the bed. She had not lost weight. It was not typical. Yeah. The onset. But I did this past week, I went to the hospital and I asked for Liza's records because I wanted to be able to look at them more in depth before you and I spoke today. And in May of 2020, Liza had to have an emergency appendectomy, which was three months before she was diagnosed Hmm. and her glucose in May of 2020, her fasting glucose, because this was at 4 AM. This would have been when she woke up in the middle of the night was 124. Hmm. And that's not really, I mean, I know that that's not extremely high, but hindsight's 2020, I think, you know, also with with an illness, you could write that off too. Yes. And that's what I told my husband. I said, you know, I don't think the doctors missed anything because she was sick. She was, we had to have her appendix out quickly and every, her whole body was in overdrive Yeah. at that point. So she did have that in May and then she had a horrible strep throat infection in June back to back from her appendectomy. So all of that went on, but back to August when she woke us up, I immediately told my husband, we've got, we've got to go to the hospital. And when we got to the end of our road, like I said, we kind of live in a rural area. The closest hospitals, 35, maybe 40 minutes from us. Mm-hmm. My husband said, okay, we can either drive an hour and go to this bigger hospital or we can drive the 35, 40 minutes here. And I said, she'll never make it an hour. So we went to the smaller hospital 
And when we got there, we pulled under the awning. And of course, they're all at the door. You know, they want you gowned and masked and they want you their temperature checked and all this. And when they saw Liza and me dragging her through trying to get her out of the car, nobody asked us to put a mask on. Nobody took her temperature. She went, she was triaged quickly in the um, front of the ER and they immediately took her to the back and the ER physician actually came in her room immediately. I, I, I would say that we were not in a room two minutes before he came in. And when he came in, he was asking me questions and he was assessing her without a mask or anything. He was all in her face, which seems so crazy, you know, to think about. But at that point in time, everybody was so obsessed with mask and all of this. So I love that he saw how sick she was and he didn't, he didn't think about that. He just was a doctor in the moment. Yeah. Immediately he says, hand me the glucometer. And this was a hospital that I previously worked at and we knew each other. And I looked at him and I said, are you crazy? (laughs) And he said, Heather, give me just a second. And all it would say was hi. Mm -hmm. When he, when I went, oh, and then it was like a ton of bricks when you see that number and he's like, where he asked where my husband was. And I said, he, they won't let him in only one person. He's in the parking lot with our son. We drug, we got him out of bed and he said he needs to take him to a grandparents and come back because she's in DKA. And, and at that point, I'm just what DKA? She has COVID, you know, that's literally in my in my brain what I'm thinking and then it all starts coming together by the time we got to the hospital Liza was unresponsive and I was doing sternal rubs on her just to get her to open her eyes and they came in and did of course a whole bunch of blood work and um everything and her her lab draw her blood sugar was 760 and they did the arterial blood gla- blood gases and her pH which was 6.7 and when i that's non compatible with life mm. and i know that is um she was so acidotic by yeah. the time i got her to the hospital we got there so he comes back in and he consults the children's hospital closest to us in birmingham he tells us that they've accepted her. They have sent orders that for them to start titrating insulin and everything to try to get her blood sugar down. But they wanted to start her on mannitol. And mannitol, if you're not aware of what that is, mannitol is a drug that's given to decrease brain swelling. So they gave, they started that. And then my husband is sitting at this point, he's back and I I understand what they're saying because of my medical knowledge and he he's kind of really taken aback by it. So for the first time in our marriage of at that point, I don't know even know how long we have been married, 16 years maybe, I was having to be the strong one for him because I knew what all this meant and he didn't and I was having to take all this in. Yeah. So he comes back in and he tells us once they get all the lab results back and they send those to Children's Hospital, that Children's Hospital called back and said that Liza was not stable enough for their helicopter, that they were sending their jet to the airport. So that was kind of mind boggling to hear those words um, because you immediately, anybody associates a medevac helicopter with urgent I don't know that I've ever known of a jet <laughs> mm. to to come, but um, so basically, Liza was she got two doses of mannitol while she was at the emergency room, and we waited and we titrated insulin and everything with her for the most part unresponsive. She would wake up after, like I said, sternal rubs, and I would do my best to ask. Do you know who you are? Do you know who I am? Those kind of questions. And it would take eight, 10 times for her 
And then she would finally get it right to tell me who she was or who I was. So when they the transport team got there, she actually, children's transport team picked her up and they rode in an ambulance from the emergency room to the airport. And then she flew in a jet from the airport to Birmingham, Alabama. And then the children's hospital helicopter picked her up at the airport and flew her across town wow. to the hospital. Were you with her? And we were no, we were not allowed to go. How did you get there? We drove and that it's about from where we were about two and a half hours oh. by car. Oh, that's terrible. Did you have any communication while you were separated? So I am a um, firm believer in my faith is very important to me. It always has been. And I believe that people are put in your path for a reason. And that day, that particular day in the emergency room, one of a very good friend of mine was the emergency room nurse that day, mm -hmm. charge nurse. And she stayed with us. And when they were getting Liza ready to leave in the ambulance to go to the airport, her name is uh, Jessica. Jessica came to me and she said, Heather, you know that it's two and a half hours. And I said, I know, but I can't leave her. And she said, well, the ambulance is going to have to backtrack to get to the airport because the airport was in the opposite direction from where I would be going to try to get to Birmingham. She said, I promise I will not leave her. I promise I will stay by her side until she is loaded. If you will, if, but you need to get on the road so you can get ahead of them if you can try. Yeah. And that's probably the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I would imagine. To leave her like that. I was in constant communication with Jessica. I knew she was, I knew she was in good hands. I knew that there was nothing I could do on the, on the jet. All I would be doing was standing there waiting on them to load her in the ambulance to go get on the jet. So Jessica stayed and my husband and I left to be able to try to get ahead of them. I can't remember a whole lot, I'll be honest, about the drive to Birmingham. I do know that I called a friend of mine who's also a nurse whose son has type 1, and I, I just needed to, to talk to someone who was there. And um, she her name's Nikki, and Nikki really encouraged me through the way. She told me that I knew what I was doing, that I was just going to have to trust that she would be taken care of and everything. And when we got to Birmingham, we had to go through all kind of purity and safety measures because of COVID, of course, before we could actually get to the PICU. But when we were walking into the PICU doors, the flight crew was walking out. Liza had not been there long mm -hmm. by the time we got there. When we got there, it was, to me... I don't know what my husband would say, but in my opinion, it was more overwhelming than the ER because there she's in the bed. They have a gown on her. She's unresponsive. She has IV lines everywhere going and everything. And it was just it, that part was overwhelming. And our children's hospital is also a teaching hospital. So there are tons of residents and fellows that are there rounding and, and of course, learning and everything. So um, Stephen and I had only been there probably not even five minutes. And the PICU doctor came in and I will never forget her because she come in and she introduced herself and she's told us in my career, I've had two children sicker than your daughter. And neither one walked out of here. And that was a lot to take in, to hear in that moment. But she was very blunt with us. At the time, I did not appreciate. But I guess now she had to do that because she didn't want, because. Yeah, you know, why do you think? I mean, I don't see the value in it. Like, do you think she was trying to get you ready for Liza to die? I think so. Um I think there was more than one reason. I think because clinically her numbers, quote unquote, were not compatible with life. And if she were to recover clinically, there would be brain damage. Mm -hmm. And 
there were lots of conversations had. I, and I get that. I, and I think I probably look at that different than my husband and maybe even even you, because the nurse in me, like the the clinically the clinical side of it, I, I'm also I'm not a nurse who likes to give bad news, obviously. But I also do like facts. I can appreciate her. I think she probably could have handled it a little better yeah. than when she did the than the way she did. Um, because we were already overwhelmed, of course. It was, but I take that. And then, like I said, I read for the first time, Scott, this, I have not had the nerve, I guess, to actually read the nurses and doctor's notes from the emergency room that morning. But I went this week and asked for those records so I could look at those. Wow. And um, I wanted to read those and kind of refresh my mind from maybe something I had forgotten or something from then. And um, my husband and I were sitting last night at the table looking over them. And it's, it's hard when you read a doctor's notes and you read him write the word death or die in his notes. And that was in Liza's notes multiple times from that morning. I don't think there were very few people who expected Liza to recover. And I don't think they expected her. I don't, I, maybe they expected her to recover, but I don't think they, I think they expected her to have some kind of neurological deficit after. Yeah. What, what, what context were the words used in, in the report? So I actually can go get those if I need, if I need to. So basically in his notes, he had, he had to make a note because it was critical assessment of an adolescent under 13. That was how he, they had, it had to be wor- or how he worded it. But basically he said that after he got the arterial blood gases back and compared those with her symptoms and everything going on, that the outcome could, could result in death. And because her, her, her carbon dioxide was 10, mm-hmm. I think that pl- I think they I, well I don't I don't think I know they based a lot of those decisions on clinical values of course and her symptoms because she presented I mean when we got to the emergency room it you could you could barely keep her awake you couldn't you couldn't get a whole lot out of her and then in the PICU when we got to Birmingham I mean she was completely unresponsive when we got there. And then I did read in the notes, which was surprising to me, that her blood sugar dropped from 760 to 430. And they stopped her insulin drip and started her. And that was when they made the decision to start her back on mannitol because her she had perked up a little bit when they first started the insulin. And she was she actually asked the doctor for something to drink. Mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden her neurological status changed in the next 30 minutes or so. And so they consulted the children's hospital and they said that her blood sugar was dropping too fast that we need. So they actually started her insulin drip back at a, at a lower dose and they added fluid that had glucose in it to try to help. Um, not bring her down so fast. Mm -hmm. I really think that the second dose of mannitol, just based off of what our conversations have been with her endocrinologist and her team at Children's Hospital, was more precautionary than the first dose. The first dose was specifically given because they truly suspected brain swelling because of the way she presented. The second dose I really feel like was almost preventative just because of the symptoms she was presenting at that time. Mm. So, yeah. So that was, um, that Heather, was how we got to the PICU. <laughs> yeah. Heather, that's the longest I haven't talked on this podcast in a long time. That was really well. And told. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no, you made me cry three different times. I was glad to not be talking. It was, no. it was just, yeah, something else. I don't cry anymore. Yeah. Um, and I didn't cry. I actually didn't cry for a while. I think I was in survival mode. And the first time 
but I looked at Liza's records and I saw some of her numbers. That was very hard for me because of the, I think it's the nurse in me because the clinic, like we just talked about the clinical aspect of it. I know what those numbers mean if you read them in a textbook. And again, I have, like I said earlier, my faith is very important to me. My church is very important to me. God is important to me. I truly believe that Liza is, and and let me just say that I know we haven't finished the PICU story, but Liza is 100% all girl. (laughs) She has zero neurological deficits. She plays basketball. She plays softball. She does gymnastics. There is absolutely nothing that she can't do. She puts her mind to it and she does it. Did she ever talk, Heather, about it? Like, what is it like to know you you just about died? Actually, yes. Um, she was, I don't think we even discussed this in the beginning, but Liza was seven when she was diagnosed. And um, she's 10 now. Mm-hmm. So a lot of Liza's day-to-day routine, she doesn't, I don't think she necessarily remembers a whole lot of life pre-diabetes because she was seven, there are some, there are certain things that she remembers, but this podcast was told to me or recommended to me while we were in the PICU. And I started in the hospital listening to you and I 100% my, my endo team knows my family know my friends know my church knows This podcast, you, Jenny, the people that come on and speak, changed the way I I manage Liza's diabetes, 100%. I don't think Liza's life would be as carefree as it is right now had I not found your podcast. I, I do not think it would be like it is because, yes, the pro tips are, are wonderful, the Every the the Scott and Jennies are wonderful. The After Dark are wonderful. Every bit of that is great. But sometimes it is just hearing other parents or even type ones themselves talk about what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And one of the first episodes I listened to, and I don't know if it was the best thing or the worst thing, but I listened to Bold with Insulin first <laughs> <laughs> out of everything. And I made my mind up then that I was going to be in control of Liza's diabetes, not her doctors, that I'm the one who li- I will listen to them and I, and I will listen to what they have to say and take you know advice. But ultimately, I'm the one who's with her every day. Yeah. And so as far as Liza goes, we have discussed that. Um, she knows I have not held anything back from her. We'll ask she'll ask questions to Stephen or myself and we'll ask her. And if you were if you were to ask Liza if she were home today, what she thinks about her diagnosis story or all of that, I can ninety nine point nine percent with certainty tell you that she would say God saved her for a reason. And it's to tell other people about him, his mercy and his grace, because and like I said, our faith is very important to us. And clinically, I should have planned a funeral, Scott. Yeah. But I didn't. You're making me very emotional today. I think there's um, something going on in my life with somebody I care about, and I don't feel like I'm helping them enough. And, oh, and then, sorry. No, no, no. Um, and then you, you spoke about the podcast, and I don't usually – I usually keep a very healthy distinction between the podcast and me. And Mm -hmm. just now when you were talking, it hit me more like, like I helped and, uh, no, you did made me upset. So uh, not upset in a bad way, in a nice way, but your story. And then you hit me with that. And I was like, Jesus, Heather, I'm going (laughs) to cry in here. Um, well, I mean, no, thank you. And I don't want to. um, No, it's very, listen, it's very, it's lovely what you said. And I swear to you on 99 other days, I would have made some (laughs) silly joke and been like, oh, yeah, of course I helped. I'm terrific. 
But um, today I just was like, oh, maybe I really do help people. And it was, uh, it just felt nice. So thank you. You do. Very and much. I can tell you that I have um, Liza's endocrinologist as actually a type one herself. And you've helped her. We have actually discussed several things and I have recommended the podcast to her. And she actually has a list of certain episodes that she will use for newly diagnosed patients. Oh, that's wonderful. Please thank her. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. I'm going to so, call yeah. going to call your episode Drive to Birmingham by the way. Nice. Okay. Hey, that's better than what my work family said. So <laughs> What did they say? They said you would name it Country as Cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I find your accent soothing. So, don't worry about oh, well, I'm, I'm all good. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> country as oh. Cornbread. I don't know how yeah. you could tell that story and then I'd make a joke about it. But um, <laughs> uh, no, I just to me, it's I mean, you know, like you the first time you got me, you said you didn't think she could make the extra 20 minutes to the other hospital. And mm-hmm. then thinking about leaving her so that you could be there when she arrived. And then I thought you must have thought, but what if I'm saying goodbye to her? Oh, 100%. Yeah. And then what if she dies while she's not with me is the other thing mm-hmm. I thought. And then that was very upsetting. I I, I, had a, I had a hard enough time leaving my kid at like, you know, in a safe apartment in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're talking about doing that. That's one of those, um, yeah, your, your perspective levels up that day. You, you know, I bet you don't fuss with silly things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know. But you've you got different perspective than a lot of people do. That's really something else. And then it then she's okay. And like you, you know, one hundred percent. While you're telling the story, it's like watching that movie with um <laughs> with Leonardo you know, the Titanic movie, where I'm like <laughs> I'm like I know how this ends, you know. But still, I felt like I was on pins and needles, and I, I haven't felt. Her story is definitely not for the faint of heart. Mm. It really is not. I haven't felt like this since DKA on a plane. Have you ever heard that episode? <gasps> yes, I did. Yeah. that I listened to that. We took a 13-day road trip out west, and I listened to that while I was driving out there. Yes, she I told, did. She told that story, and then we get to the point where the doctor is from a different country, so they misread the numbers, and like if they do the wrong thing for the kid, and I'm like having a conversation with somebody who I am fully aware their child is fine, and <laughs> I, and and I'm listening to the story. I'm like, it was making me crazy, and then I put it online, and people were people had the same reaction. Like that was incredibly intense, and it's 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 not as much about what's said. It's a it's more about what you imagine is being felt while you're listening to the story. And that's your story sure. is really good. I swear to you, like the breakdown on this is going to be Heather spoke 80% of the time. Scott was 20 and 10% of that's going to be me putting in the ads and like saying stuff like, welcome to the juice box podcast. Aww. And I'm happy about it. That was really well told. I think there's something about the blend of your, your medical background with the fact that you were involved in this situation with your daughter and it, you just told it very, very well. Do you tell people this a lot, or is this the first time you're saying this? I actually, well, before I answer that, I am sorry that I have, I think I jumped around a lot. Oh, no, no, I'm good. Don't worry about that. I am, um, the way I think of the podcast, Heather, is, uh, have you ever seen Pulp Fiction, the movie? Yes. Yeah. You know how Travolta's alive, then he's dead, then he's on the toilet? <laughs> That's how I think of this podcast. So don't worry about okay. it. I, I like that very much. I, I like the way it keeps people. I think I think it keeps people engaged while you're talking. So okay. I, I'm happy with that. The, then yes, if um, the answer to your question is yes, I have I have told this story to several people. Mm-hmm. I use it most people. Like I said, we live in a very small town. So, and when I say small, Scott, I mean that. You don't, you don't have all the ingredients for the cornbread. You got to go out and buy it somewhere else. That's right. <laughs> I, I don't even have a grocery store in my town. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Pre K through 12th grade is in one building, and there's about 550 kids. We're tiny. Mm-hmm. We li- we're very small. So most people here know Liza, they know her story. I have had the opportunity twice. Friends on Facebook that are military, they had actually an Air Force wife. 
she was, her daughter was diagnosed. And so my friend reached out to me and asked me what I'd be willing to, to talk to her. And I did. I was able to do that. And of course, immediately recommended juice box. And she and I still communicate back and forth with that. There's been several other instances with people where I've gotten random Facebook messages or even text messages. I have used it. Again, this is Liza's story, mm-hmm. obviously, but there are several things that have happened along the journey that have helped me. I know I've said it a hundred times, but I'm not sorry for it. Uh, my faith is important. And Liza had been diagnosed about six months, maybe, before I actually looked at her her lab work and everything. And... I was just looking at looking at it, and it, it did upset me. I think I told you that just a second ago. But I heard slash felt the Lord tell me that all of the we had fertility issues with Liza. We struggled to have her, mm-hmm. and I, as the, uh, the amount of peace I had in that moment, I heard plain as day, your fertility struggles were preparing you for today, because. When Liza was diagnosed, I needed to know that you would trust me and not doctors, that you would put your trust in your faith in me. And I needed to know that you could do that. And I have looked at diabetes different since that day. This is just a journey. Liza's whole story from conception till now, Mm -hmm. from the fertility to everything. And it's helped people. A lot of people struggle and it's with not just diabetes. I mean, people's mental health is real. People struggle with all kinds of things. Yeah. And if I can be a light for anybody, just by telling the struggles we've been through and how we've overcome them, mm-hmm. overcame them, then I have succeeded. That's all I want. That's, yeah. that's all I want from any of this. Even today, I've been so nervous about doing this really? with you. Aww. Yes. Well, you didn't have so to nervous. be. I'm not even talking. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to no, be nervous at all. That's what, <laughs> that's what my husband said. He said, you know, you're going to just start talking. I was like, I know. <laughs> it's okay. That's that's good. It's a podcast. We need people talking. It's been fine. You know, as far as like our when we, we left the PICU, and here we go, back doing another turnaround. She was in PICU for a day and a half. And then she moved to step down and then we were, we were sent home. Wow. That quick. So Three days. From death's door to home in three days. Yes. That's crazy. Good for her. That's wonderful. Three days. Yeah. Yeah. Good for all of you. You know, what strikes me that I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up. So this is three years ago. Almost August will be three years. You've been listening to me for like three years. Yeah. You know, I'm not a religious person. You don't care, right? I don't. Yeah. I love that. I love, I love, I don't care, by the way. I mean, care is the word, wrong word. Like, I don't have a thought in the world about how people like worship or anything like that. I know. And I respect that. I, I, because you, I love that you have been open about that, that you don't, you don't stop people from sharing their faith or, yeah. or whatever. You let us talk how we want to talk. No, I'm just, I'm very impressed because I've had people like say, I'm not going to listen anymore because you said that. Or when Arden did her episode, I think Arden like flat out says she doesn't believe in God, right? In in one of her episodes. And I got mm-hmm. a I got a lot of pushback from a few people about that. And they're like, I'm not listening to this anymore. And I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, I really think it's gonna help you with your diabetes. But if that five seconds is gonna stop you from being helped, I you know, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. But yeah. no, I was just very like, I am happy for people to to share how they feel. I think that's what the point of this is. Like, I don't I wouldn't understand just bringing people on who like flat out agreed with everything I thought or vice versa. It doesn't make any sense. So I'm, I'm just sure it's really lovely. Thank and you. at the end of the day, Scott, like religion aside, my goal, you know, like, like I said, I, I knew that you're, that you're not religious at all. Yeah. Just based on the, the, the last three years of listening to you, I can't let that stop me. And what I believe, you know? Yeah. Oh, no, and, I wouldn't want you to. I just, I'm impressed that you didn't, st- like, I, 
it says a lot about you, I think, that you listened to that and then you didn't say, well, I'm not going to listen to him. He doesn't, he's not aligned with me on other things that are important to me because it doesn't matter. Like if I understand no. one thing and, you know. And, but and, also, yeah. Scott, you got to look at it from my way too. That would not be Christ-like. Thank you. Yes. That would not be Christ-like for me to right. to say, no, I can't affiliate with him because he doesn't believe the same way I do. Right. I'm a heathen and I deserve to be saved just like everybody else. Right, Heather? You deserve Christ. Yes, you do. Right. I was almost going to say goddamn right, but I don't think contextually that's the way to go. <laughs> but, but no. That was very nice. Thank you. It was very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. So how does, I mean, three years later, how does Liza manage? What does she do? And what are your days like with diabetes? Well, she's uh, G6 and Omnipod 5. Uh, we actually just had our endo appointment and her A1C is 5.9. Oh, wow. Good for you. So her original, I did. I don't think I said her diagnosis at diagnosis. She was ten point two. Yeah, I was going to say. Pretty so high. she's five point nine. Now we're still prepubescent, so we haven't started a whole lot of hormones and mm -hmm. everything yet. Right. I'm actually researching looping. I have a lot of questions that I can't get answered yet. My endocrinologist is completely on board. If we, if we want, I love Omnipod Five. Let me say that. Yeah. I just. Kind of like, I think, your experience with Arden. I wish the target was lower. I'm overriding probably more than the algorithm likes for me, too, <laughs> mm -hmm. when it comes to that. But, I mean, our nights are perfect. Her, our night, I mean, that in itself has been worth it all for her. Now, I'm also an advocate. I, I don't even know if this matters, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So, Liza was on Dash, of course. And when Omnipod 5 made their release last spring, mm -hmm. that the limp, well, in January, I think it was the limited release. And then in May is when they actually did a full public release right. for the Omnipod 5. I believe that's about right. Yeah. I sent an email to Liza has a patient advocate through our private insurance company. And I sent an um, email to her and I said, hey, what do I need to do? to get this added to the formulary because it's added. It's open to the public now. It's full release. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, well, we'll just have to do a authorization. I said, okay. So we went through the whole ordeal, getting the endocrinologist to fill everything out and all that. And then our insurance company comes back and says, nah, we're not even, we're not, this is too new. It's in limited release. We can't do that. And I was like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> So I, I emailed the actual link from Omnipod where they had full FDA clearance to the CEO of our insurance company. And I said, I don't know who you pay to figure these things out for you when you make decisions that affect people's livelihoods. But you might want to get them to do better research because here is the link where this Omnipod 5 is fully released by the FDA. Yeah. And so... It was so funny. The next morning, there was a company-wide email sent out that said, not only are we going to approve the Omnipod 5, but you don't even have to have an authorization for it. We're just going to put it on our formulary. Wow, Heather. Very nice. I know. Good for you. So, well, and it's sad because most people would have took them at their word. Yeah, that's what happens. And it just it takes time for them to catch up. Like, it seems so yes. obvious from your perspective, like, you know, at home and you're, you know, there's things out, you've been watching it and waiting for it to come. And you think, well, how could they not know about it? But they sometimes they don't. And the companies, right. it's kind of the company's job. You wouldn't think this, but it's a company's job to kind of go door to door with the insurance companies and say, hey, look, we got this new thing out here. Here's what it is. Here's like, and that's uh, time consuming and, and man, a lot of manpower. And some of them, yes. you know, it was and it was, um. You know, it, it was funny. I mean, it, it was my effort as aggravated as I was in the moment because the information was wrong. I'm so thankful now because people don't eat like other people, other children, their parents are not going to have to fight it. They can just get yeah. the prescription for it and go to the pharmacy and pick it up. Yeah, that's really now. that's a really kind thing. You, I mean, you did it for yourself, obviously, which was terrific, but it does end up helping a lot of people. And that's, yes. that's pretty cool. I Listen, I told a story a long time ago, very, very long time ago, about Arden getting an insulin pump when she was four. 
and mm-hmm. I completely bucked the system at the hospital. They did not like they tried hard not to get me to even get an Omnipod. They didn't know anything about it. It was new. They, I think they were scared of it, et cetera. And I was just ignored them. I went with my gut, took it and, you know, never looked back. And it took them almost two years. But like two years later, they pulled me aside and apologized for trying to derail me from it, said they just didn't know anything about it. And it was hard to support for them. And that because of Arden's success on Omnipod, they started to prescribe it at a major children's hospital on the East Coast. And, yeah. and I've always felt really good about that. You know, we have a similar story with that because if it had have been left up to our endo team, you know, they wanted Liza to wait six months for her Dexcom and they wanted a year for her pump. And so Liza was diagnosed in August. She had her Dexcom in September mm-hmm. because I went and I said, she doesn't have to have any. There's no requirements by my insurance. I just need a script for it. That's it. And then her pump took a little longer because of COVID. They were only doing three people at a, three or four people at a time sure. for the pump training class. So she, but she started her pump in March. So around six months, I mean, it was not long after we were pumping. We were not MDI very long. And actually it's because of an episode that you had. I cannot remember the name of it now, but so, you interviewed somebody or it may have even been you when you, when Arden tried FIASP, mm-hmm. I think. And so that we've been on FIASP ever since. We have, we, we dropped Novolog and went to FIASP and it changed everything too. That in itself helped a lot with yeah, managing right. her. I, I would love to, honestly, I would love it if Arden could use it. It just, you know, it doesn't, yes. doesn't agree with her very well. But um, yeah, I mean, faster is, Obviously, it changes everything. You don't have to pre bolus as long. You know, it it, it digs yeah. into the spikes. It's all great. I, listen, this is this is the value of this medium is sharing um, in a way that you know doesn't have to be immediate. And meaning, like we, when people put video up, like video has a very short window. Like it hits and people watch it, and then it kind of stops. And right. and audio is great because it's it's not intrusive. You can listen while you're driving or, you know, any number of other things that you can't do while you're watching video. And, um, it's just, it's great to keep having all of these conversations about your daughter's diagnosis and what insulin works for you. And I mean, you know, you're doing great with Omnipod five, but here's what I have to do to make it work. And these conversations need to keep happening so that people can find them over and over again. And, um, just, just wonderful. Yes. It's a wonderful thing. I, I'm a little stuck on the, this morning before I recorded with you. I had a business call, and Uh-oh. and I and we were talking about. Do you really want to know what I was talking about, Heather? I think I'll tell you. So okay. I've seen sometimes companies do these things where they put a lot of effort and time and money into producing these videos that they put up on YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. And um, once in a while, I'll look on one of them, or and you know they end up having like you know, 30 views or 110 views or something like that. And I think all that money and time and I see people wearing makeup and there's good lighting and how long it must have taken to edit all this so that a hundred people could see the video. And I think just come on the podcast. I'll get you to tens of thousands of people in like a, in a, like a snap of a finger. And, I know. <laughs> and, and, and yet they're like, Oh no, we want to go waste a bunch of money over here. I'm like, oh, okay. That's great. But, you know, whatever, like, it's fine. Um, I think sometimes audio, it ebbs and flows. And not, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not complaining. The podcast is doing terrific. But I think it can feel old to people at times. Like, oh, that's been around forever, podcasts. I'm like, yeah, it works. That's why. It's it's a mm-hmm. v- valuable way to get information to people. And um, I don't know. I would have never dreamed. Because I was prior to August of 2020. I didn't listen to podcasts. I'm amazed you have internet access. <laughs> hey, me too, right? I mean, I just thought I would teach you about that once. Uh, but yes, <laughs> yeah, if you were yes. Canadian, we would have never stopped talking about you living in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that, yeah, it just, it's a great medium for all this. Like, even your story, like, I don't know. Like, it, you know, it just, it needs to be heard and, and this is a great way to do it. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. I and and she's just doing so well. Like there's, it's such a turnaround from you know. And and, and you know what else? 
I have to say, while you, while you were talking, the idea that there's a medication to reduce brain swelling, and there's mm-hmm. a medication to bring down your in your, your blood sugar, and they know that coming the blood sugar coming down too quickly is bad. So then there's a way to infuse glucose to slow it down. And all of the knowledge that people have from all these emergency situations in the past, and I don't know, just the the fact that the tubing exists and the and the needles and the infrastructure and the I, I think it's easy to ignore that it's astonishing that we have a system in place that saved your daughter's life. Like it almost mm-hmm. seems unrealistic that that a ho- that a hospital exists like that, and um, and yet there it is and. And no lie, it, it absolutely saves Liza's life. Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, I'm thankful for everybody that was involved in her care. I'm thankful for the knowledge that they had that they that God blessed them with that they were able to do it. It also like sometimes it, it, it's not angering, but it's it's like I get that things are too expensive. Don't get me wrong, right? Like I I know they are uh, mm-hmm. all over the place, but people go to college to learn how to do a thing because they want to make a living and right. a private company opens up a hospital because they're trying to make a profit and like and on and on and if it wasn't for that that hospital wouldn't be sitting there like it just it wouldn't be there and it wouldn't exist and and there's a way to be like i don't know why i'm mixing these ideas together but like i've just seen so many people say like oh everything's too expensive like yeah but you know what it paid for that institution that sat there when your daughter needed it well, I can tell you, I never thought I would get a bill for my daughter to have a private jet ride somewhere. Mm. <laughs> but I was uh, not sad to pay that bill. Can I Can I ask how, how much? $29,000. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> but you make yeah. $4 million a year, so that's not really a problem, right, Heather? I mean, that's nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Do they take payments? <laughs> um, yes, uh, yes. They they didn't have a choice. <laughs> We're gonna send five dollars a week. <laughs> well, that's it, it was um it was good though. I mean, you know, it really, I, I'm, that's funny that you said that. I mean, the amount of care she received and the amount of meds that she had to have, the ambulance, the jet, the helicopter. I'm actually amazed that my bill wasn't more than that. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's it's just that it exists, I think, is the thing that I'm I'm stunned by and not because of where you live, but just in general, like that we've built this society. You, you, you know, it's fat. It's fantastic that it exists. And oh, yeah. I bet that as horrible as it is to pay a twenty nine thousand dollar Uber bill, <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet that while you, I bet it's the easiest money you ever sent anybody to. Right. Yeah, I think that which this is way off course, but I'll say the same thing. We, we are partners of hope with St. Jude in Memphis, Mm -hmm. the St. Jude children's hospital. And it's the biggest hospital in the country for, for pediatric cancer patients. And I donate blood there. Yeah. And I do that specifically because I know where my blood is going Mm -hmm. when I do that. And also the blood donation lab is the same lab as the patient. So as I'm sitting there, having my blood donated, I might see a baby come in in a wagon to get her blood drawn to see if her cancer is gone or something like that. I I find peace in that, knowing that I'm helping others there. Yeah. But we also send money every month. My husband and I have for 16 years every month to St. Judas bank drafted and everything. And if I never have to enter those doors as the parent of a patient, it's mm-hmm. money well spent. Yeah. And I'll never regret it at all. I think to help bring attention to St. Jude, yeah, there's, I think now it's like a Netflix doc- documentary. But on one of those SpaceX missions to space, they sent, they trained a St. Jude nurse who was, as a child, a St. Jude patient. And uh, they sent her to space on a mission. Like they made her into an astronaut so she could go to go to space and to draw like attention to St. Jude at the same time. And it's a Netflix documentary. I'm going to find out what it's called to tell people. Um, That's really interesting. Yeah. Hold on a second. How 
we who went to space for St. Jude. Uh, physician assistant Haley, I don't, I don't know, her last name, it's a, it's a Southern name that I always have trouble like pronouncing, even though I know somebody with this last name, A-R-C-E-N-E-A-U-X. Haley. I have no idea. Ar- and, um, she's a pilot. Uh, she was a pilot, a geoscientist. Oh, hold on a second. Jude physician, um, physician assistant Haley and geoscientist Cian Proctor and aerospace data engineer Chris Sombrowski. Um, they went to drive support to the life saving mission of St. Jude Research Hospital. It continues. They raised, yeah. I, th- so I think the idea was to raise a certain amount of money um, with, you know, the efforts they were putting into the training, et cetera, of these astronauts. They were really like publicizing it, trying to drive money to St. Jude. At the end, they didn't. If I'm not mistaken, they didn't raise as much as they wanted. Yeah, they had a two mm-hmm. a two hundred million dollar fundraising goal for St. Jude, and um, they didn't reach it. And Elon Musk threw in fifty million dollars to push them over the um, the number because I wow. mean S- SpaceX is his um, his company, I guess. But yeah, they they made this great documentary about it. I'll have to look at that. Yeah, that I watched on Netflix. Let's see. I wish. For the life of me. I just finished a good ep- a good series on Netflix. Yeah, it's called Inspiration Four Mission to Space. Oh. Countdown Inspiration Four Mission to Space. It's a like a five part episode, like a documentary about them taking these four people and just making them into astronauts and and sending them up. And Saint Jude was a big part of it. So anyway. that's nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and and geez, you know, you're watching it and. Like fifty million dollars. So first of all, like again, like you with the airplane ride, it's just chump change to Elon Musk, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> but uh, but really, like like just wonderful. Like he just was like, hey, I, from what I understand, he's like, oh, we didn't make the goal. I really, I really wanted us to make that goal here, and he wrote a check for fifty million dollars. So wow, um, yeah, and it helps all those kids. And I don't yes. have the exact experience that you have, but I can say, I rethought. So when I was younger, my daughter was much younger, and Arden first had type 1, we used to have to go into the city to go to the children's hospital. And now there's mm-hmm. a, there's an annex that we could go to that was closer to our house. But mm-hmm. I always found it sad. The children's hospital always made me sad. The parents looked sad. The kids looked sad. Everybody looked tired. And it was hard for me to go there. But I think that was a little bit of my youth too. Like I wish if I was older, I, I might've sat there and had more feelings like you had, because I have experienced that moving forward as an older person. When I have to go get those, when I talk about my iron, like getting an iron transfusion, which I've done a number of times, you are basically in an infusion center where most people are getting chemotherapy. And, right. and so it really is uh, like, I, I've, I've described it in the past as it feels like a holy place. Like I'm mm-hmm. very like, quiet and referential when I'm in there. It feels, it feels like a, I don't know. It just feels like one of those places. So yeah, I get your point. Anyway, um, Heather, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? I don't think so. I mean, I was nervous. I don't know that I should have been because you made it pretty easy. (laughs) I don't know that I did anything, but thank you. (laughs) To go through, but my goal was to, you know, Liza's story is definitely, not your typical, what I would consider a typical DKA story. Mm -hmm. And I told it and, you know, she's doing great. That was my biggest thing is, you know, I wanted people to know that just because it looks horrible in the moment, that does not mean that the sun's not coming back out. Yeah. That it's not going to be okay. Because if you had have asked me when Liza was diagnosed, if she would be playing basketball softball, gymnastics. I couldn't see that in the moment. Mm. I, I I could not envision that in the moment. And now, as much as diabetes, we know, which I, you know because of Arden, she has type 1. Okay, great. But type 1 doesn't consume us. It doesn't control us. Yeah. We If we fail at something, we figure it out. If, if Liza wants to try something new, we make our best guess. And if we, if we fail, we make notes and we try again the next time she has practice or if it, if it has to do with sports or if it has something to do with her wanting to eat something, 
we make our best guess. And if that's wrong, we make notes and we fix it. If we overdo it, we give her some juice and don't give us much next time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good for you. That's wonderful. I If I have any mm-hmm. part in that at all, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. So no, uh, you, you 100%. So Scott, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the time that you put into the podcast. Thank you for you making that decision 17 years ago when Arden was diagnosed that you were going to make her life better because if you had not chose to figure this out and to make it almost your life mission to figure this out for Arden so her life could be as normal as possible. I don't know that I could have done as much as I have for Liza as, as quickly as I have for Liza That's very because nice. you, the information you have gathered for all of us is right there. You just have to want to take it. You just have to want to listen to it and figure it out. Yeah. So very, thank you. Oh, you're very kind. That. I was trying to thank you and then you turned it back on me. But um but but I, that's very very kind and I I I'm fully feeling what you're saying. You have me in a very emotional spot. So I don't have any oh. I don't have any sarcasm at all to fight back with right now. No. Yeah. I do have a question for you. Yeah. One question. Is it will it be very hard and if you can't answer it today that's fine. Will it be, is it will it be extremely hard for me to move Liza from Omnipod 5 to Loop? Well, there's a couple of thoughts here I have about that. First of all, with the A1C you have, I don't know mm-hmm. that that I don't even know that it's necessary. It sounds like you're doing <laughs> you're doing terrific. Um I think I'm more worried about her period. I think I'm more worried about the control I'll have when that starts. Yeah, I mean I don't know. Like, I, I think people's hormonal impacts are different, obviously, and who she, you know, how her body grows and what ends up needing to be done. I, I don't honestly know. I also think that you're, I mean, what are you planning ahead by two or three years, maybe? Or I don't know. You're not I, sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, everybody, you know, they, they talk about that at every visit, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, the settings are slightly there'll be different you know sure. so like because right now you're using omnipod 5 which is making it's making all of your basal decisions for you you don't really know like what it's like all of what it's doing right um you can sure. you can see your total daily insulin so you should be able to take your total daily insulin and just reverse engineer it to loop if you wanted to and you know make it um i'm sure you could get about to that but if this is a thing you know already I wouldn't switch just to switch, but if okay. you if you think it's there, then you I mean you can absolutely try. Like there's other things to consider with Loop. Like you're gonna right. buy you're gonna buy a Mac computer. You're gonna need to mm-hmm. own, you're gonna need to own a Mac computer. You're gonna become an app developer. You're going to you know you're using a do it yourself system. It's not supported by a company, and something goes wrong. There's nobody to call, and um, right. You know the other day Arden's Loop app like it just hosed up a little bit. Like it just kind of got unresponsive for a minute and it was fine. But there's a moment where you go, Oh, there is no one to call. If this stops, working. <laughs> it's just, there's no 800 number. Scott, yeah. she's going to call you. No, she was on. No, she, she was already on the phone with me. Don't worry. I was, I was <laughs> in, in full, uh, in, in full colors trying to figure it out while she's telling me that's not working. And I'm like, I am trying. Hold on a second. And so, um, <laughs> you know, th- there's that to consider. There is the consider as well that, you know, at any time the FDA could step up and I don't think they will, but they could step up and say to the company, like, don't allow that to happen, like block it with software or something like, I don't know, like, I don't think it would happen, but it could, you know, and like, that's a a consideration, you know, I don't know, like, I, I gotta be honest, like, I wanted Arden to use Omnipod 5 and yeah, and she was, she's like, didn't want to carry the PDM. Like, so I don't know that by the time the next thing comes around, she won't jump back again. Like, I love, I I, want to be clear. I love Loop. It's fantastic. Like, Mm -hmm. really legitimately fantastic. But a lot comes with it that I don't foresee Arden living with her whole life. Like, she doesn't want to do the things that it takes to make Loop. And now, and now with, I don't know if you saw the other day, Islet got, um, they got FDA approval for their pump. The comp- oh. the company's called Beta Bionics. It's a tube pump, but the way they're describing it, 
is you tell, like you get the pump. If I'm mistaken, I, I might not have all the details. You tell it how much you weigh, and then you announce your meals as like small meal, medium meal, large meal. And that's it. Like that's how you, wow. that's how you bolus. So okay. now how is that going to work out? I don't know. I've got to call in to somebody trying to get somebody on the show to talk about it. I did have the opportunity recently. Um, I had some private time with one of the doctors from Beta Bionics where we talked for probably an hour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know that their outcomes are any better than the other systems. It's just the way you use them. Um, I don't know about spikes and like, it's not going to be perfect. Like I, I wouldn't want anybody to think like, wow, it's just going to work so much better than everything else. Cause I don't think it is. I think it's going to work about the way what we have now works. Um, it's just that you're not going to count carbs. You're just going to say, this is like a larger meal than I usually eat or a smaller meal than I, or something like that. But so that that's even, that's like, that's great. You know? So my point is, that is, really is. Yeah. By the time she's, 12 or 13 like i don't even know what will exist like hopefully there'll be an omnipod six or whatever i don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna do it you know what i mean like i, I want everybody to keep going i do love Me too. yeah i love that they don't have the ability to nobody can rest on the laurels now somebody's gonna mm -hmm. come in and like keep innovating and i i think that keeps everybody honest and i'm i'm a big fan of that so i don't know yes yeah, technology it's sale from you know, Liza's been only been diagnosed only almost three years. And the amount of things that we have watched change in three years is mind boggling in itself. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. No, I agree. It's just, it's the way it's moving is just, it's faster and the leaps are bigger and bigger. And I, I don't know where we're going to be in a couple of years. I'm excited yeah. about where we'll Me be. Too. Yeah. But I don't know. That's all. Yeah. I don't know how to like, and, but if you're going to transfer from one to the other, I think you could obviously do it. I mean, you know what you're doing. So Sh I'm keeping it in the back of my brain for yeah. sure. Yeah. No, there's no reason not to stay abreast. And really, I mean, I'm a huge fan of you got to know what's going on out there and you, you jump when it's time to jump, you know? Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate you doing this very much. Can you hold on one second for me? Yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you. I want to thank Heather for coming on the show and sharing that amazing story with us. A huge thanks to Dexcom for supporting the podcast and for sponsoring this episode. Dexcom.com slash juice box. Go get yourself a Dexcom G7 right now using my link. If you'd like to wear the same insulin pump that Arden does, all you have to do is go to omnipod.com slash juice box. That's it. Head over now and get started today and you'll be wearing the same tubeless insulin pump that Arden has been wearing since she was four years old. If you're not already subscribed or following in your favorite audio app, please take the time now to do that. It really helps the show and get those automatic downloads set up so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.